Good morning to everyone. I open hearing number six of the 185 ordinary period of sessions. That is called arbitrary detentions and situation of persons deprived of liberty in a Salvador state of emergency, which has been requested by Amnesty Cristosal, Fundación de Estudios para Aplicación del Derecho, Fundación para el Debido Proceso, Instituto de Derechos Humanos de la Universidad Centroamericana José Simeón Cañas, the uh, office in Washington for Latin American Affairs, and Servicio Postal Pasionista. I am Julissa Mantilla Falcon, President of the Inter American Commission and Country Reporter for El Salvador. Commissioner Estuardo Rallon, first Vice President of the Commission, Reporter for Persons Deprived of Liberty, is here today as well. And Joel Hernandez and Commissioner Bernal. Also, the Assistant Executive Secretary, Maria Claudia Pulido, Special Rapporteur, uh, Soledad Garcia, and the Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, Pedro Vaca. I would like to greet the civil society and the Inter-American Commission regrets the presence of the state of El Salvador, although it was timely notified, but the state declined its participation in this hearing. We will now open the hearing. The civil society will have 20 minutes, then the commission will have 30 minutes, 30 minutes with final comments and uh, closure by the commission. Now we will give the floor to the civil society organizations. Good morning, honorable commission. My name is Veronica Reina, I am part of the Servicio Social Pasionista. We regret the state is not present here in this hearing. This shows once again the lack of interest of the accountability of the state regarding human rights violations in the country. Once again, the state does not explain, give an explanation to the victims and does not participate in international spaces regarding human rights. It is of great concern taking into account the authoritarian um, scenario we are going through in El Salvador. We are thankful for the uh, possibility for the organizations to participate and to show to this commission the situation of persons deprived of liberty and the impact in our human rights due to the implementation of the state of emergency in the country. In April this year, the National Police presented to the House of uh, Paris in Salvador and asked who was living in that uh, house. And um, they asked about the sons who were not there. When they got there, they were transferred to a prison. Both of them were detained. The family mentioned that they had been threatened before by one of the police as they had denounced some abuses. In June, the family was notified of the death of one of their sons without any detail about the cause why he was in prison. Danilo, 20 years old, had to run away from his home after his mother and two sisters were detained. His mother had denounced policemen. They got to their home in April and imprisoned her. Danilo and his sister denounced this event by they started leaving threats and harassment by the police. They is he's in charge of his sisters and he has suffered from internal displacement due to police abuse. A 30 year old man was detained by the armed forces in San Salvador. According to several witnesses, he was beaten by the military forces, which caused several serious injuries. He was transferred to a hospital and he died due to this. A 22-year-old man with intellectual disability was detained by soldiers. His cell phone was took from him and they put a knee on his head. One policeman hit him on his head and the back. Other witnesses asked them not to beat him. The soldier threatened them to detain them if they didn't go home. Civil society organizations who constantly suffer attacks by representatives of the state, even the president Bukele have documented 4,071 alleged violations of human rights during the state of emergency. 
the Paris family doesn't have that last name. Danilo is a, is a fake name. The names have been changed because they are afraid. We cannot state the date who are the witnesses who are the victims. These families are afraid the police may go to their homes and imprison them or they may suffer um, co the consequences of denouncing the events. This state of emergency is an inconstitutional and convention uh, detention of human rights. In October 14, the Legislative Assembly has once again expanded the suspension of rights to the uh, population of El Salvador. Until October 14, 55,000 people had been detained, although the, this speech insists on the fact that these people are collaborating with the gangs, organizations registering illegal arbitrary patterns of detentions, ill treatment, torture, threats, and deaths of persons who died. We will present now more details regarding the victims of the abuse caused by the state of emergency without admitting that there are 80 families who are still waiting for the response of the state regarding the death of their relatives under state custody. I will now give the floor to Saira Navas of Cristosal. El Salvador is the country with the highest number of persons deprived of liberty with a rate of 2,000 people detained every 1,000 inhabitants. Until March 13, 9,000 people were deprived of liberty. According to state figures, between March and October, 55,062 people were detained. However, the capacity of these prisons until February was of 30,000 um, spaces. That is to say, overcrowding is causing degrading situations for those who are detained in the country. The state of El Salvador is implementing a criminal policy that privileges detention as the main uh, response to crime using the state of emergency before the incapacity of implementing comprehensive security measures. As a result, more than uh, thousands of people have been detained without uh, prior investigations, and many of them have been uh, detained for more than six months being um, since April. The administrative detention and the pre-trial detention is carried out in prisons throughout the country. There was overcrowding, adults were mixed with uh, minors, women, men, and LGBTIQ+. The overcrowding causes fights, uh, illnesses, uh, physical punishment, and psychological violence caused by the inmates and the authorities, among other serious violations. The authorities transfer them constantly. In September, women who were detained in the pre-trial uh, detention center, the women's prison, were sent to prisons that were uh, used for men. This center is now occupied by men, and families were not informed of their transfers, no the centers to which they were transferred. On the other hand, the lack of health, attention, supply of medicine, and specialized treatment to the inmates, including those who suffer chronic diseases or serious illnesses, has caused the um, death of several persons and the worsening of some of these illnesses. Families have to purchase the medicine by themselves only specialized medicine with prescription are allowed to enter, but not that is not possible for families to get the prescription, especially for psychiatric medicine as they are controlled drugs. The lack of economic resources makes it hard for many families to buy the medicine and take it to the uh, prisons. In 
the situation of the persons who have uh, AIDS is a particular concern. We want to draw the attention of the Commission to the particular situation of women as relatives of the detainees, they have to take care of the family group and they are in charge of finding supplies and legal representation for their relatives. In the case of women who are detained, they are accused of collaborating with the gangs without prior investigations and without taking into account, they may have been subject by the members of the gangs used as sexual slaves who have been forced to take after the children of the gang members or used to traffic drugs, and they are victims of the gangs in the state. In Bartolina Policiales, this has been extreme. No, uh, they have no water. They do not have access to utilities or medicine. The situation within women's prisons are violating the physical integrity, psychological, psychological and sexual, among other rights. Overcrowding has caused serious situations. Up to 100 women live in the same cell and sleeping in the floor. One glass of water per day. Two eyes a day, they can access the toilet. They cannot go during nights. The lockdown is constant. They cannot have access to the sunlight and no recreation activities. And this causes several emotional crises. The use of isolation in punishment cells is also used, limiting food, which also causes skin and respiratory illnesses. 80 families in El Salvador are still waiting for a response of the state regarding the death of their relatives. I will now give the floor to Sonia Rubio. I will now make reference to three types of human rights violations that are taking place within the state of emergency and out of great concern to these organizations, arbitrary detentions, the tortures or ill treatments and the death of persons who are detained in penitentiary centers. Regarding arbitrary detentions, since the state of emergency was implemented, different operations have been carried out within civil police and the armed forces. As a result, 55,062 people have been detained. In practice, many of these detentions are of young people as they live in uh, areas uh, where there are many gangs or poor uh, sectors, sometimes because of their clothes, they work uh, close similar to those of the gangs so because they have tattoos they are detained since the state of emergency has been implemented these organizations have received more than 4000 demands uh, many of them may be considered arbitrary or illegal detentions these detentions may be based on crimes according to the current legislation they do not comply with the minimum requirements in such as having an order for the detention or being detained um, during uh, because of flagrant acts and without respecting due process. This situation has been pointed out by the working group on, a, on arbitrary detentions and together with different uh, bodies of the UN have expressed their concern regarding the elect violation of human rights caused by the state of emergency. Furthermore, we have documented that state authorities do not want to provide information regarding the whereabouts or detention of the persons deprived of liberty to the relatives, lawyers, or human rights organizations, which could give account of secret detentions uh, in the country. There is no access or limited access to legal representation and access to fair trial after they are detained. 
due to the lack of independence of the judicial system, the organizations have documented cases that allow us to conclude that probably the state of El Salvador is not complying with the duty of prohibiting or tolerating torture, especially within uh, centers of detention, whether by officials, persons who are part of gangs or other inmates with the tolerance of public officials. The organizations have registered cases of persons that once detained have been subject to uh, physical aggression by the military forces after they were taken from their workspaces or homes. They have been documentation of practices of uh, violence to women, vulnerable groups, uh, harassment before their detention. And these practices are more frequent in some centers such as the uh, Center Esperanza, according to the testimony of inmates um, who have stayed in that center, many uh, inmates are beaten by other inmates or by officials. It has been denounced to the authorities by the families of the detainees, but up to date, the investigations have not been carried out in order to punish the responsible ones. Lastly, regarding the deaths under state custody, there are approximately 80 people who have died. According to the available information, the deaths were a result of um, officials having beaten the uh, prisoners, the lack of medicine to treat chronic illnesses within these uh, centers. Among the most alarming aspects, we could mention that up to date, we do not know any ex officio investigations in order to clarify these uh, events and the lack of information of notification of the deaths to the relatives. As a result, some people ended up in common graves as Henry Hoya, which has been exposed by the media, who was exhumated after being 103 days in a common grave in a cemetery in the country. This shows that the state is not uh, explaining how these persons have died and they have not adopted the measures they have to implement to avoid this from happening. State authorities continue to attack those who criticize these serious situations and keep on using social media to stigmatize social um, civil society organizations and international organizations for the protection of human rights. I do not want to conclude without highlighting that up to date, more than 80 families are waiting for a response by the state of El Salvador regarding the death of their relatives. I will now give the floor to Henry who will present the uh, response of the estate. Good morning. In my intervention, intervention, I would like to talk about the response of the state in this state of exception. The state has reformed several legislative bodies and together with the strategy of the government have led to massive violations of human rights of the persons deprived of their liberty in an arbitrary an illegal way, especially there have been several violations of the norm of due process of law. Regarding the judgment of the 10 persons since the very beginning of the state of exception, um, legal hearings uh, have been massive. There are over 600 people at a single hearing. This goes against the right to defense and the presumption of innocence of those detained. This should be can see this should be considered together with the fact that the hearings are held online and each person has only five minutes to speak. In addition, in all cases, there is no individualization of the persons that are detained or the degree of participation in the crimes is not determined. And also the provisional detention of these persons is determined for six months without any right to reply. And also in the writings that justifies criminal 
persecution against uh, detained persons, we see that those writings do not comply with the requirements of law. And therefore, uh, all these persons that are detained are detained because of the same criminal type. Because of time, it's not possible to relate each person to a single crime. And also the public prosecutor office has not provided information to the family members of those detained. And also there are cases in which family members have reported that the public prosecutor office does not provide them with a lawyer. And also there have been reports of ill treatment by public attorneys against the family members of those detained. Also it's important to measure the role of the public prosecutor office for human rights. They have denied existence of human rights violations uh, against persons detained during the state of exception. And this is inconsistent with the records of the participating organizations. In addition, the director of criminal centers uh, has had uh, a very poor um, performance. They have stopped communicating information on prison centers. Some months later, this director decided not to reply those requests for public information that he received. And on several occasions, we have tried to request information, but we have received no reply. Before concluding my intervention, I would like to recall that 80 families of El Salvador are still waiting for the reply of state authorities regarding the death of their family members. I'd like to give the floor to Belisa Guerrero from Amnesty International. Taking into consideration what has been presented before, the requesting organizations of this hearing request the Inter-American Commission the following one, due to the lack of appear uh, of the lack of role of a state to so to for the commission to monitor the situation of human rights of the country. Second, to continue monitoring the situation of human rights in El Salvador under this state of exception and to request the thematic rapporteurships to verify the situation of detention of those deprived of their liberty in order to avoid the violation of their rights, included in Articles 4, 5, 8, 25, and 26 of the American Convention. The, the condition of children and adolescents, as well as women and members of the LGBTI community that have been detained, and also the legal reforms that have an impact on their rights. C, the situation of human rights defenders and justice operators so that their work can be done without retaliation. Three, taking into consideration the seriousness of the facts uh, presented in this hearing, and taking into consideration the hearing of the 184 period of sessions regarding uh, the requirements of Article 59 of the Rules of Procedure of the IACHR, we would like to request inclusion of El Salvador in Chapter 4B in the annual report of the Commission next year. Fourth, we want the Commission to call up on the state of El Salvador to eliminate the state of exception. And also, we want the state to con uh, we want the commission to conduct an investigation on the death of the persons who have been detained and died and also to investigate ill treatment and torture also we want the state of el salvador to comply with due process of law and other and judicial protection including in articles 8 and 25 in order to stop with illegal and arbitrary detentions. We want the state to create a policy of reparation, including non-repetition measures. Also, we want the state to guarantee the independence of justice operators and also of those people who monitor and oversight the situation. Also, 
to we want the state to abstain from taking any actions against human rights defenders and also the state should provide permission to the Inter-American Commission and other human rights organizations to visit the country, to verify the situation, persons deprived of their country in detention centers, to verify the compliance of the process of law norms, and also to, the, to monitor the development of the criminal investigations on the cases of those who lost their lives under state custody. I would like to highlight that 80 families are still waiting to have information on the way in which their family members died while they were under the state custody. Thank you so much. Now I would like to give the floor to the different members of the Inter-American Commission. First of all, I would like to ask the first Vice President, Commissioner Estuardo Rallon, if you have any questions or comments. Thank you so much, Madam President. Good morning distinguished representatives of civil society organizations. Uh, we regret the absence of the state of El Salvador today. This is a space within the framework of the Inter-American system of protection of human rights um, aimed at addressing the issues related to human rights as it has been mentioned and requested by several representatives of CSOs. Um, as rapporteur of persons deprived of their liberty and against torture, um, we would like to say that what we have heard in this, at this hearing is a situation that is dramatic, drastic, alarming, and that should be condemned. We have been told that there are systematic arbitrary tensions detentions and on many occasions a person is just detained because of the way of dressing or because of where they live and any person or any citizen that is going to work that is moving from one place to another could be detained just because of that. There are also very clear reports and complaints on torture. Um, you have mentioned that there are 4,071 complaints on torture cases. You have indicated that um, the state of El Salvador is conducting acts of torture and tolerating acts of torture. So I would like to know if you have any figure or any record of these complaints regarding acts of torture in El Salvador, which you have mentioned. Another aspect that I would like to mention and that I would like to condemn is the fact that many people have died in detention centers. According to Inter-American standards, the state should have guaranteed their physical integrity and their lives. You have mentioned that 80 families are still waiting for a reply because their family members have died under state custody. So I'd like to know if apart from the anguish and the sadness and the pain, I would like to know what is the position of the public prosecutor office, if there is any investigation or if there is a lack of willingness to investigate these facts. This is a question that I have, and I would like to know uh, what you have to say regarding the investigation. Y por otro lado, pues eh, reiterar el compromiso de la comisión de seguir monitoreando la situación, tomando nota de Commitment of the commission to continuing monitoring the situation based on all the petitions that have been made. The commission will continue calling up on the state to not normalize, normalize this situation. The commission should be a voice because inter-American and international standards regarding persons deprived of their liberty should be respected. And the state is the guarantor 
of their life and their integrity. And there are basic conditions that should be guaranteed so that there is no inhuman, degrading or ill treatment against these persons. Thank you so much. Those are all my comments, Madam President. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. First of all, I would like to thank civil society organizations that are participating today for your petition for this hearing. I'm very glad that the commission has granted uh, this hearing. This is a, an issue of a lot of concern, not only for El Salvador, but for the region as a whole. We are seeing that extraordinary measures are being applied against a specific group or population that is persons deprived of their liberty. I regret that the state is not here today, but I hope that some state authority is following up on this hearing through electronic media because it's important. It's important that they are know that they are aware of the complaints of civil society organizations, of the work that you are doing to document all these situations. And I believe that it will also help um, promote spaces of dialogue between civil society and the state and to understand better what is happening. There are many issues that have been presented today and we need a reply from the state. Having said this, I would like to focus on two specific aspects. The first has to do with the situation of persons deprived of their liberty, and the second has to do with the mechanisms of monitoring. Regarding the first aspect, as you know, the Commission conducted an in-local visit to the country in 2019, towards the end of 2019. At the time, I was in charge of the rapporteurship of persons deprived of their liberty. We visited Bartolina uh, or uh, police stations and detention centers, and we found several situations of concern. They are reflected in the report, and we see that now things became even worse. And I would like to know how extraordinary measures are being applied for persons who are at police stations, which are the so-called Bartolinas. I would like to know how much time a person can stay there until that person is subjected to a formal accusation. The second aspect has to do with monitoring, as I said before. We are well aware that in every democratic society, accountability should exist and accountability should be done before national bodies, but at a supplementary level by international bodies. We know that President Bukele requested a new human rights prosecutor to evaluate the situation. And if you have any information in which the prosecutor will be evaluating the situation, I think that it would be very important to know the mechanism that she will be using. And as one of the colleagues already indicated, I would like to know how civil society organizations have the possibility of visiting police stations or detention centers to verify the situation of persons deprived of their liberty they are in. At an international level, I would like to say that the working group on arbitrary detentions of the United Nations has already pronounced together with other special mechanisms. I would like to call up on civil society organizations that apart from resorting to the IACHR, I would like for you to go to the special mechanisms within the UN because all international organizations should commit it to these facts. I am really sorry that El Salvador is not a state party to the optional protocol on the Convention Against Torture, because if it were, there would be a national mechanism to prevent torture. 
within El Salvador. And in turn, the subcommittee against torture could conduct in local visits, but that's not the case. What I want to say that it's important to have accountability at, an inter at a national level, but also at an international level, because this would show the commitment of the state to applying public policies at a criminal level, complying with the highest standards um, that should be applied regarding persons deprived of their liberty. If the state does not improve this, the international community will not be able to have the elements to understand well the impacts of these extraordinary, extraordinary measures that are being taken. Thank you so much, Madam President. Thank you. I would like to give the floor now to Commissioner Bernal. Thank you, Madam President. I also would like to thank civil society organizations for participating at this hearing and to be able to participate here as well. I'd like to thank all the organizations for the information that they have provided us with. Um, the information shows in a very illustrative way the situation that is occurring right now in El Salvador, not only with regard to arbitrary detentions, but also the whole situation of human rights in the country related to those arbitrary detentions. I also regret that the state is not present today. The goal of this hearing is to promote dialogue, to identify ways to resolve a conflict or to overcome a situation of violation of human rights. And the best way to achieve that, that is through dialogue. I would like to second the question of Commissioner Hernandez, but I think that it's very important. So I would like to know what judicial and extrajudicial instrument, instruments exist today in El Salvador to protect the human rights, because we have been informed today of several violations of human rights. I would like to know if those mechanisms are independent or if they are being managed by the state. I would like to know whether those mechanisms are independent. I would like to know if the human rights prosecutor is independent, if the public prosecutor office is independent, if the judiciary is independent, or if those mechanisms are not independent. And secondly, and I think that we agree on this, that is, no way of justifying torture. There is no way of justifying forced disappearances. There is no way of justifying arbitrary detentions. And taking into consideration this specific aspect, I would like to know what the petitioners think, because I need to understand your perspective regarding the statement that is always present in the newspapers. The explanation that the state provides is that this is the only way of protecting the rights of the rest of the population. They say that this is the only way to create order, to stop murders, and that is present all the time on newspapers. So I'd like to know what you think in this regard as petitioners, taking into consideration the argument that is presented on media outlets. Also, they show figure regarding the reduction on murder rates, among other things. So I would like to know what you think in this regard. And I would like to express my solidarity towards you and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I'd like to take the floor now. I would like to make some general comments first. We have mentioned that the state is not present here and that we regret that. And I would like to say the following. The states are, are part of the Inter-American system and that are members of the OAS um, yield their sovereignty in this way. And in the case of the Inter-American Commission, that is one of the main bodies of the OAS that exists even before the American Convention, our role is that to monitor 
and to verify the situation of human rights. And the hearings are a mechanism that the Commission has at its disposal. We are really regret that the state is not here today. Secondly, I would like to reflect on the states of exception. As their name suggests, they are states of exception, exceptional states. But when the state of exception is the rule, we have a very serious issue. The American Convention permits states of exceptions, but with some specific characteristics. If there is no situation of discrimination, for example, detaining someone because of their aspect. Also, internal resources cannot be suspended. And there are also exceptional situations and the use cogent norms, including the prevention of torture beyond the treaties, the prevention, the protection of the right to life, those things cannot be suspended. So here in this case, we are seeing serious issues in this regard. And also, well, let's focus on the issue of this hearing, that is illegal and arbitrary detentions. These are arbitrary detentions, and this is very important because they are not legal. And within this framework, it's important to take into consideration the situation of persons deprived their liberty. And I would like to ask you some questions. A week ago, in the American court issued advisory opinion 29 on persons deprived of their liberty. And although we have the American Convention and we have the standards, I would recommend the state uh, to learn more about this advisory opinion because it has information and standards regarding LGBTI persons and women. And this advisory opinion that is a standard recognizes something that is so basic, how the situation of inequality and discrimination outside detention centers is also present in penitentiary centers. So I would like to know about the situation of women deprived of their liberty. A basic principle that is included in the advisory opinion is the separation of men from women in detention centers. So I would like to know this about the situation of women and the situation of their reproductive and sexual health. I would like to know what is the situation of pregnant women who have been detained that have children. And additionally, I would like to know the situation of detained women, and also I would like to know the situation of women partners and family members that are in charge of their search when they visit those persons that are deprived of their liberty and when they request information, I would like to know what they face. So this situation is very serious, and I think that it would be very important to have all these details and all this information that you have and I would like to ask you an additional question. The risk suffered by those organizations that are denouncing the situation of arbitrary detentions in case of persons deprived of their liberty. We have some minutes left. I would like to know if the executive secretary for monitoring has any additional questions. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to greet all the civil society organizations and the persons who are watching this hearing, I would like to say that the Commission has been monitoring since March and has published press releases in April and June and Article 41 a letter to the state of El Salvador that has been answered with the elements that had to do with the state of emergency and the situation of persons deprived of liberty. But there is an element that for the work we have been carrying out within the executive secretary uh, supporting the commission, which is key, and it has to do with access to justice and with massive uh, hearings. Uh, could you provide further information about how these hearings are carrying out, the type of accusations? You were saying that they have five minutes to defend themselves. Uh, the resolutions, the judicial sentences, how they are being funded, and what kind of measures are being implemented by the judicial 
power uh, pre-trial uh, detention measures for how long and another aspect regarding Amnesty International, which has an international and regional perspective on the rights of persons, whether there are similar situations in other countries in the regions where you observe these massive detentions, massive hearings, what are, why is the situation in El Salvador different from other regions in uh, other countries in the region? I'd like to ask uh, Rapporteur Pedro Vaca if he wants to make any comments. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to greet the Commission, the Executive Secretariat, and the persons who have petitioned this hearing. I consider that you have provided valuable information in order to understand a situation of great public relevance involving many human rights. Thus, the rapporteurship is interested in making questions to the organizations. We regret the presence of the state in this conversation. It's very important for the Commission to have reactions from the state, taking into account the elements that have been mentioned, such figures in during this period of time that seems to be extended those watching the hearing uh, will know the absence of the state. And I have some questions, comments, Madam President. The first one has to do what has been said regarding the uh, legal norms, especially those related to freedom of expression. The rapporteurship issued a press release this year criticizing the increase of punishment with vague uh, concepts. It is impossible to distinguish between a prohibit uh, and punishable activity and the exercise of freedom of expression. I'd like to ask the organizations, whether you know cases, situations in which the uh, um, amendment of legislation regarding freedom of expression uh, has affected um, members of society, if you can provide written information about that, and if you could share your opinion on the effect of self-censorship when we talk about expressions that about a direct or indirect connection with the gangs that is part of a gray area, academic uh, investigations on the state of emergency, uh, interviews on the state of emergency may be considered as prohibited and punishable. And I would like to say that there's a special protection for the uh, public affairs, the state of emergency without a doubt is of great public interest in any state. In that regard, the rapporteurship is interested in knowing what the organizations think about public debate uh, about the um, state of emergency. We believe that uh, people with information who suffer these human rights violations, are they able to share this publicly or they are afraid of speaking about the state of emergency? I would also like to make questions regarding access to information. The rapporteurship has received since 2021 demands regarding regressive measures in terms of access to information, do you have specific examples that register this um, retrogressive aspect? In terms of monitoring, there are uh, crimes related to persons who want to express themselves in social media, is that related to the state of emergency or not? 
regarding monitoring as well in El Salvador, official media outlets, the official media outlets are part of a, an important ingredient of public debate. And I was wondering whether relatives of detainees have been uh, interviewed by public media. Is there a place for the society who is demanding about human rights violations do they have access to public media within the state of emergency recently we have heard about the new public defender do you think that freedom of expression is one of the aspects in order to be deepened uh, when it comes to a bilateral dialogue with the state, I would like to thank the participation of those participating in the hearing. I will now give the floor to the civil society so that they can expand their comments and answer these questions. Thank you, commissioners. I will make reference to the role of the public defender and the application of the state of emergency when there's a lack of protection of the citizenship. Regarding the first point, some of the organizations present here today have tried to develop different uh, documents that allow the legislative assembly to have resources for the process for the uh, selection for human rights prosecutor complying with different aspects to take into account for the profile of the candidate this process was not taken into account by the assembly, there was no proactive participation by the civil society, taking into account of the assessment of the profiles that were selected. Not all criteria were complied with. Um, in the case of the human rights prosecutor that was selected, she does not comply with the notorious morality aspect because she was sanctioned by, she was punished by the court due to certain issues uh, in her mandate that antecedents for human rights organizations makes the elected prosecutor as a profile that could shouldn't have been uh, taken into account especially in this context of human rights violations that is the first element of great concern regarding the um, role of the prosecutor this has been a trend in the last elections for a second degree positions looking for profiles that are loyal to the interests of the legislative assembly and Bukele's administration that affects the independence we have to see how the elected prosecutor exercises her mandate but this office is becoming an institution that justifies or supports the serious human rights violations, avoiding opinions or condemning serious violations that we are denouncing. The prosecutor had a stigmatizing uh, speech against civil society organizations and do not consider the importance of the role uh, carried out by these organizations. The president has offered the prosecutor regarding the state of emergency. And so far, we do not have further information on how this is going to be done. Two society organizations have not been called 
those who have been documented cases, human rights violations, and we have not been summoned by the prosecutor in order to see how we can participate in that process so that she can review the different cases and documents we have gathered with the organizations. So we do not know whether we have the possibility of participating and visiting Bartolinas or detention centers in order to know the situation of persons deprived of liberty regarding uh, social media, which is used by public officials and the current prosecutors, we know that she met with relatives uh, of the victims of the state of emergency. There is a collective who is trying to make the abuses visible. Uh, these violations that took place within the state of emergency, we got to know that she met with this collective and with um, victims of the violence produced by gangs. We are constantly monitoring the mandate of the prosecutor, but without the independence, she may exercise because of the way she was selected and because of the relation in nepotism and corruption uh, cases related to the current prosecutor. Regarding security policies and the state of emergency, the um, repressive populist uh, speech in you know, Osolovo regarding security policies have tried to prioritize that kind of um, measures. This state of emergency is widely accepted, but according to the uh, service carried out by the Instituto of Opinion Pública, we can see a decrease in the support to the state of emergency when the arbitrary detentions demands are made public or uh, when information about people who were detained and uh, suffer physical violence by the police. This affects the uh, public opinion on the regime. And something that is quite interesting, but it is not publicly, is not made public by the current administration, is that there is a differentiated uh, perspective regarding the state of emergency that makes it effective for the um, apprehension and detention of the gang members. But several members of society are against the suspension of rights within this regime to all the population. And the fact that we do not know the crimes that uh, How people are being accused of without further information the percentage of um, the population rejecting this measure is increasing and there's an increase in the level of awareness however i would like to highlight that the state of emergency is a response to the end of dialogue between the current dialogue and the main gangs in the country. This has been documented by journalists and official documents, which were made public by media outlets. And there was an investigation through the previous prosecutor that was uh, destituted or dismissed illegally. And there were negotiations between state officials and the three main gangs. After that dialogue ended and the massacre uh, caused by the gangs, the government responded with this state of emergency to show the capacity of violence between the gangs and the state. We believe this process cannot be sustained there is no public safety, public security policy. These uh, measures are hidden by the state and we do not know 
what's going to happen to more than 90,000 people who have been detained, whose rights cannot be guaranteed. We do not know the current situations of detention and the repressive speech does not allow the creation of other kind of uh, policies for social um, reintegration. Thank you. I would like to make reference to the questions related to torture and investigation of deaths, situation of women, and in general to hearings and the situation of uh, the organizations. I would like to say that the state of El Salvador systematically has declared confidential information about persons detained during the state of emergency regime, the crimes they are accused of, and it has declared as confidential the information about the penitentiary population, the detailed information about men, women, minors, and there's no investigation spite of hundreds of complaints that are published daily by the media outlets and that human rights organizations receive and which we have been forward to the institutions regarding the serious situations in detention centers. Regarding tortures, the data that we have is based on the information we receive from the persons who were deprived of liberty and who have been freed due to certain measures. The government informs that at least 800 people were freed. They, that is not true. The legal proceedings continue. That means that people are afraid of publicly giving their testimonies because they are constantly being threatened that they are going to be detained or their relatives are going to be detained. As Christo saw, we have interviewed persons who were freed, who suffered torture as other organizations, and they have expressed serious situations. For example, general uh, physical aggressions, in the case of women, which the president of the Honorable Commission mentioned, women who were beaten within the penitentiary centers, in the case of men in Ilobasco Center, there are five centers there, Visaco, the, that includes five penitentiary centers, two of maximum security people are detained there, as in Marionda, and when they enter this prison, people are beaten by police uh, officers as a well, way of welcoming them, as they say. This has caused serious illnesses and the death of many that they need. In the case of women, as I was saying, the situation has become extremely seriously because the women's detention center had a capacity for a thousand people. However, the number of women detained is of approximately eight to seven to eight percent that meant serious situations such as women who were beaten not only by the officers when they were complaining of a serious health situation but by their by the other inmates at the inter-american court overcrowding overpopulation produces conditions that lead to fights and the situation of women has become very serious. We were saying that in their case, they are only allowed to use the bathroom as men twice a day, once uh, to, and considering that food does not require all the necessary conditions, sometimes food is rotten and this produces serious illnesses and the complaints of the inmates leading to fights and a terrible situation. Many of the women due to the lack of space eh, have to use um, 
a small bucket as toilet. They have to wash with little to no water. They have no water to take a bath. They, this also affects their situation when they have their period or they menstruate and they are particularly affected because of the fact they are women, women. They are in charge of taking care of their children. And there are many cases of women that have to be in charge of children and also elderly cousins, brothers, neighbors. And this situation, if we take into account that they are the ones looking for the detainees who are sometimes disappeared because the uh, state does not provide information about where the person is being held. Women have to be looking for the relatives. This implies serious economic uh, problems. And regarding the investigation of the deaths, we would like to say that the government has denied systematically that deaths uh, are their responsibility. They are denying the international duty regarding the rights that should be guaranteed to the persons deprived of liberty. The general director of penitentiary centers has made the victims, uh, has blamed the victims of time, saying that they did not take the necessary drugs. Well, we know the specialized medicine are not allowed within uh, these prison centers. Sometimes uh, families have to buy medicine and when they allow to give them to the inmates, uh, sometimes the medicine gets uh, lost. There was a TV interview in which the director said that they have investigated and 50% of the deaths were not produced because of the state's responsibility, but it did not provide any information about the case that has been investigated, how it was investigated. Organizations and relatives had filed lawsuits. They have not been asked to give their testimony. There is no serious investigation of these cases. Without these investigations actually took place, we believe that the prosecutor's office denies any responsibility because an institution is an institution influenced by the executive power. And they usually say people die because of a, an illness, when in fact, in many of the documented cases by the organizations, we have a, determined that they have been tortured and their health is uh, the result of the physical aggression suffered within um, detention centers. Sometimes it is said that they have died in these centers, but actually they were not. The general prosecutor establishes that it is the responsibility of the persons who are detained and does not take the responsibility of investigating state officials. Even when there is proof, people have been beaten by the police when being detained. Finally, I would like to say that the hearings in these kind of processes that I heard by specialized courts that have been specially created for the state of emergency during Bukele's administration. They are faceless judges because we don't know the process through which they were elected and appointed. We don't know who they are, whether they have necessary training. In these hearings, at the beginning, more than 700 people, uh, prosecuted people were uh, heard. They just 
read the name of the person, they do not determine the elements, uh, the evidence that they have, they don't make any individualization. They are one or two defenders for several hundred um, detainees and the uh, defenders only have a few minutes to present the case and the presence of the uh, persons accused is fictional as they are on screen but they cannot participate. Just one thing, I want to say, taking into consideration the perspective of uh, petitioning organizations, we can say that the current situation of human rights in El Salvador is probably the most serious since the end of the armed conflict 30 years ago. Um, the state is not assuming even the most minimum in international commitments, especially those that are non derogable such as the prevention of torture or impartial and diligent investigations to clarify the death of persons under state custody that could be extrajudicial executions. And also, we see that um, many times information on detained persons is not available. Sometimes uh, these detained persons are without state protection for hours, days, and months because their technical defense, their family members, or the human rights organizations interested in this matter do not know their whereabouts. And though this situation has been denounced from the very beginning of the regime of exception, it has not improved. An example of this situation are those deaths in detention centers. Sometimes family members realize that, that their loved ones are dead when they're, these family members or these people are in common graves. Uh, regarding the question made by Rapporteur Pedro Baca, freedom of expression is not actively restricted by the state of exception, but the provisional measures taken uh, have tried, have attempted to restrict freedom of expression. Any person who opposes or criticizes the government fears being stigmatized, persecuted, or criminalized because of this behavior. Um, taking into consideration some of the figures and information that we have, we know that journalists and communicators um, are indicated that um, the official media outlets um, are attacking human rights organizations and undermining our monitoring work. And we know that journalists are seeing their rights to life and to integrity being affected. And also, many decide to self-censor themselves because of the level of risk, which is increasing. And many of the changes that are happening, not only in terms of criminal law, but also when it comes to communication talking, we are seeing that this leads to an increased risk when conducting journalistic work. And also, with regard to freedom of expression, some people that are Twitter users have been detained. And the state of exception and its framework has been used to detain them. And sometimes those detentions are not justified what's happening is that they are first detaining persons because of what they say, what they denounce on social media. They are publicly exposed uh, and they are punished at a social level, but at the same time, their social accounts are being investigated to accuse them of some crimes. So the punitive power of the state is used to silence those who oppose the government. And therefore, we believe that the persecution against journalists and human rights defenders 
leads to 10 journalists that have decided to leave the country. Seven of them are men and three are women. And this leads us to reiterate our position. We see that the new public, um, human rights prosecutor should address the issue of freedom of expression and the exercise of the work of human rights defenders because the closing of the civic space that we are seeing in the country increases the risk and the violations of human rights against human rights defenders and journalists in El Salvador. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd like to make some specific comments regarding some situations. You were asking about the criminal type used to prosecute over 40,000 persons in El Salvador. Um, these people are prosecuted because of the crime of illicit association. This crime has been reformed several times uh, under states of exception, and even journalists can be prosecuted or judged um, if they decide to publish the tattoos that the detained persons show. And there is a contradiction in this because the government of El Salvador presents detainees semi-naked and exposing their tattoos, but at the same time, there is a resolution that reads that any person who shows these tattoos could be prosecuted. And this creates self-censorship among journalists and media outlets in order to prevent their journalists uh, from being prosecuted or judged. So far, six months have elapsed since the creation of, or the implementation of the new regime of exception. The Public Prosecutor's Office has requested extending um, this state of exception for another six months to prosecute and investigate these persons. And we are seeing that the extension of the state of exception could be extended several times. And as a result, persons will be illegally detained without knowing their accusation. What we are seeing is that these pensions are, these persons are being detained constantly. And therefore we need, what we see is that there is an extension after an extension of this state of exemption. And this creates a lot of issues. Thank you so much. I'd like to answer the question asked by Maria Claudia Pulido, Assistant Executive Secretary, regarding the comparisons that can be made between the situation of El Salvador and other countries in the region. I don't think that any other country is experiencing a situation as the one in El Salvador because of three reasons. There is no other state in the region that has implemented a state of exception for more than six months. Now we have a permanent state of exception in practice in El Salvador. Second, the massiveness of arbitrary detentions in El Salvador is unprecedented. We have documented several massive detentions, especially in context of protests. In Venezuela and Nicaragua, these detentions have not been as massive as in El Salvador. And thirdly, and this has to do with uh, the detentions, El Salvador has the highest rate of persons deprived of their liberty around the world. And we see the violation of several fundamental rights, such as due process of law and right to defense. Thank you so much. Thank you um, to all civil society organizations. Sonia, would you like to take the floor? You have one more minute. I just want to conclude by saying and reiterating that at least for 
the petitioning organizations, it's important that the state of El Salvador assumes again its commitment to giving a reply to these 80 families regarding the death of their family members who were under the state custody. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Can you hear me well? We are reaching the end of this hearing. I would like to thank and respectfully greet each of you on behalf of the Inter-American Commission. As I always say, this is important, not only because you're here, but because of your daily work. You have brought to this hearing the voices of several organizations, of several people, of several families that are losing their hope. And our role as Inter-American Commission, we need to express our commitment to the, that hope. We will continue to rate, rate the requests of the civil society. We will continue um, our work through press releases. We have some reports on organized crime and the situation of girls, boys, and adolescents in Central America. We will continue with our work. And I would like to say this publicly. The Inter-American Commission is ready to visit El Salvador whenever the state authorizes this. We have requested this. We have made this request several times. I think that the state should submit to international scrutiny to guarantee the human rights of people and to stop with such ma so much pain and injustice that is happening. In spite of the state's absence today, I don't want to stay there. What I want to do is to offer the possibility of the Inter-American Commission of visiting El Salvador, of working to take action and to prevent and to analyze from there what's happening with the situation of violence at the general undifferentiated level. Monsignor Romero would say the following, nothing, uh, reforms are not useful if they are tainted of blood. And I would add that reforms are not useful if they are tainted with so much pain and lack of hope. The commission thanks you for being here and we are at your disposal as always, as always to continue working and to play in our role. And to those in El Salvador that are following us, we want to tell you that you are not alone, you have us. Thank you so much. And I would like to adjourn this hearing. Thank you.